You remember this picture? Now, don't raise your hand for this because it'll date you. <clears throat> what? Me worry? This was a uh, picture, of course, of uh, somebody known as Alfred E. Newman, uh, you know, uh, from the, the mid-1950s. Now, I grew up uh, in that, uh, began to grow up in that time frame, and I have memories of these things, and on the cover of Mad Magazine for so many years, right? And I see some people smiling because they remember as well. We won't identify them, so they will, uh, their uh, identity will be uh, unknown. But this was a time that, in the 1950s, it was a time when, when I think a lot of people you know, the war was over and the, 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 the country was actually, the economy was booming, everything was upwards and looking ahead, and uh, I think things were going well, at least people felt that way, there were, the economy was, uh, was doing quite well, and uh, who cares, who's worried about anything? Well, it doesn't matter what little things are going on, why worry about it? And then we moved into the 1960s, and uh, another uh, uh, decade of... Uh, a lot of things going on, maybe not quite as, uh, as upward um, looking as the 50s because we were involved, as you know, in the Vietnam War during those years. It was very contentious. Uh, however, um, the attitudes began to change and the attitude that developed in the 60s, I think, is, can be summarized to some extent with this little uh, phrase, if it feels good, do it. People were of the opinion, you know what, it's the, the flower children, remember? Everybody was, uh, you know, trying new uh, drugs and doing strange things. Uh, and people were uh, just uh, really going off the deep end, especially the young ones. That was the Woodstock era. If it feels good, do it. That's the way people were thinking about life. The problem was, they weren't thinking about this. The consequences of their behavior and their decisions. And so, people in that age were dropping out of school and forming their own little, you know, uh, co communes and places and just thinking not about tomorrow but all about today. Uh, I know some of us, uh, I can look around and see, remember those time frames. They were not interested in the consequences. And you know, life's decisions do have consequences. In fact, if I had a controller, this, some things seem like they never change. That is, people now, in the 60s, People now, especially the young, struggle with some of the same issues throughout the, their years. That's why we have been studying a very pertinent book that is actually a little hard to find in your scriptures, as you know. It's called First Californians. Um, but it, that's because it's so relevant to our congregation, and I, and I mention this for the per benefit mostly of those who have not been here uh, before. Notice that uh, we're studying this book, it's a little hard to find. It's actually called First Corinthians, um, but it applies to us as well now, today, as it did 2,000 years ago. And I'm afraid today you're going to experience something that you'll say, oh yes, we have this problem as well. You see, Paul was writing to this congregation about many of the difficulties that they were encountering as new believers in a society that surrounded them that was anything but holy. Now, there are some disagreements about exactly what was going on in the city of Corinth where Paul had started a congregation and uh, was writing to them here. Some, uh, some people think, and, and, and I think there's evidence that it, had, it was a pretty secular, shall we say, uh, community uh, filled with things that would probably seem characteristic of uh, Southern California, perhaps uh, our area. And uh, it's interesting to, to uh, study those things. We have been 
going through the book and looking at the things that Paul has written to them. And one of the things, remember, he started his, his uh, letter out talking about disputes, factions that were growing within. And we don't have that here, do we? So that's a good thing. And he wouldn't write that. We don't have any disagreements here. We're all on the same page, aren't we? And uh, so as he's passed through all of that, well, he's now moved into a, a section in his letter where he's calling them to holy living. And that occurs in chapters 5 and 6 of the book. And without going into more detail, I uh, encourage you, if you have your scriptures with you, would like to uh, open them up to chapter 6. I'll be uh, teaching from the New American Standard Bible, the right Bible for now. For now. For now. I know Chris is disagreeing. Actually, it's very New American. I've been looking at it. It's very, just a little few Hebrew, Hebrewisms in there. It's, not, it's very similar. And uh, if, if you would, uh, we're at verse, uh, moving on to verse 12. I want to read the text to you completely first. Not something that I always do, but I want to do that just to get the flow of where we are. So let me read, beginning at verse 12. We're going to read uh, to the end of the chapter. All things are lawful for me, Paul writes. But not all things are profitable. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. But God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Messiah? Shall I then take away the members of Messiah and make them members of a prostitute? May it never be. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee immorality. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. So that's the text we want to look at this morning. It's rather long. It's more... Um, verses than I normally uh, cover, but there's a reason I'm covering this together because it's actually a unit of thought. It's a unit of thought. And now, if I look at this whole text, as you heard and looked at what was written there, ask yourself, what jumps out at you? What is it that Paul is talking about? Well, here's the whole text on one page. I know you can't see it all from the back. I uh, don't expect that you can. But um, you notice, I'm sure, that he is addressing the question of prostitution in this. And he's not real pleased with it. And you look at this text and you say, is that what this text is really all about? One way of understanding what a scripture is referring to, what's the main point of the scripture, is to look and see which word or words or phrases are repeated in the text. And when you look here, you see that the word prostitute is actually appears twice in the text. And you say, well, okay, that's, you know, it's repeated, so I suppose there's, you know, Paul's got that in his mind. But you might have overlooked the appearance of another word. And that is the word body or bodies. It appears eight times in this text. There's a little clue there about what Paul has in mind then when he's writing this portion of his letter. He is concerned and brings up the question to us, does God really care what I do with my body? Does he really care about that? Because it seems like Paul mentions it a lot. So let's, let's kind of take a little slower walk through the text this morning and, and, and see what it is that Paul is saying about all of this. 
and I'll, I'll go more carefully now, line by line, through this text, and uh, let's see what we can draw out of it. Does God really care about our body? He begins with the text in verse 12, that all things are lawful for me, but not all things are profitable. Now, if you are looking at an uh, NIV translation, it probably says if all, all things are permissible. The Greek word really is not necessarily having anything to do with law, but having to do with the idea of you may or may not do something. So this is not referring to Torah. This is not a, a rabbi talking about whether uh, the Torah says you can do something or not. This is referring to what you, what you feel you, know, you can and can't do. And, and when Paul says all, th all things are permissible or allowed for me, uh, but not all things are profitable, he's really saying he's just come off a passage where he's talked about uh, people who will not enter the kingdom of God, who are doing things that are not acceptable to God and will not enter the kingdom of God, the fornicators and all the other things that he talks about uh, that will not be part of the kingdom. And now he says, all things are permissible for me, but they're not all helpful, they're not all profitable. He doesn't really mean that it's okay to... Uh, to go and uh, kill his neighbor or to uh, steal from them or that kind of thing. That, that, that's, that's not an all thing that Paul has in mind. But there are behaviors that he says are okay. And he says, I can do any of these things, but they're not all good choices necessarily. And notice when he says all things are lawful, he doesn't say, he's writing to them, he doesn't say all things are permissible for you. He doesn't say that. He says, all things are permissible for me. But when Paul writes here, he's writing to a group of believers. And when he says, all things are permissible for me, he's telling them, basically, you know what? This applies to you too. Follow along with me. You guys and me, we're all in the same boat here. We can do just about anything because God will let us do things. The question is, are we wise in, the, in our choices? He says, so all things are lawful, repeats this phrase, which is, by the way, a phrase he'll repeat later in, uh, on in, in the text, and if we go further in 1 Corinthians. But he says, all things are permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by any of them. I won't let anything control me. Another way, another way of understanding this text, I kind of rephrased it here. Anything is in my power to do. But I will not be overpowered by anything. I have the power to do anything I want to do. But I will not let that dictate. The fact that I can do things will not control me. I will not be, in a sense, I won't be tempted. Even though I know I can do bad things and probably get away with it. I'm not going to let those things, those thoughts dominate my decisions in life. And he, now he brings up an example, which is kind of an interesting one. He talks about, he says, he jumps from this discussion about, uh, uh, you know, choices of things we can do, and he says, and now all of a sudden he's talk, he jumps to food. He's bringing an analogy here. He's trying to set up something that he's going to be talking about in a moment. And he says, food is, he brings up food, which is something of some concern, scripturally, you know, in the history of, uh, of the, of the uh, Jewish faith, certainly food was one of the many areas uh, that the Jewish people had guidelines given to them by God. And so he, is he talking about that? I don't think he's talking about the kashrut laws here. He's just talking about something that everybody can relate to. Because everybody eats. Some more than others. Food is for the stomach. And by the, word, by the way, the word food for is not in the Greek text here. And, and so what Paul is writing in the Greek is not so clear what he's, what he's actually saying. Food and stomach kind of go together, and stomach kind of goes with food as a place that it will gather the food. It's a, it's a place where you can, you can... The food is clearly a place that uh, will... That's where the stomach is a place where the food will go. So, so those two are kind of designed for one another. You might say they're kind of dedicated to one another. I mean, there's no point in having good food if you can't eat it, and if you don't have a stomach, you probably can't eat the food. And some of us have bigger uh, places for food than others, but that's all right. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. 
but God will do away with both of them. See, there are times when your stomach tells you it wants food. It's called hunger. And when you're hungry enough, you're going to go out and try to satisfy that need. The stomach tells you periodically, doesn't it? I hope it's not telling you that right now. Because we have a long... Term. No. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you kind of get the idea that there's something inside of you that will call you and attract you to do something. It's called feed me. Your stomach says feed me. And so you eventually you're going to go and do that. And I think that's what he's talking about, that, that the body sometimes gives you a signal and calls you to do something. And in this case, go get food. Nothing wrong with that, depending on what food you choose, I suppose. And uh, some of us choose better than others. So he's giving this example about how the, our body works. Then he goes on to say, however, the whole body, yet the body, is not for immorality. Even though you may be feeling a call to try to satisfy a need that you have, that your body is... See, your body's designed... He's getting into the whole sex thing here. And uh, we've been designed for this. as we all know. But the body may be calling you to satisfy its need. Yet, like the stomach calls for food, the body calls for some release, sexual release. But it's not to be satisfied the wrong way by an immoral solution. Because your body should be for the Lord as a believer. And if you keep that in mind, you won't find yourself being drawn towards the immoral ways of satisfying that need. And he says, the Lord is for the body. This is, this is part of the, 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 the difficulty in understanding exactly what it is that Paul is saying, that somehow he's saying that the body and the Lord are are now connected in a way. Just like food and the stomach are connected, there's an attraction there. The question is, how do you handle it? How is it that the Lord is for the body in the same way that food is for the stomach? Well, there have been a lot of discussion by the commentators about that, and you can think about that yourself. Fundamentally, I would say that what Paul is saying here, the Lord cares about, he's dedicated to your body. He's concerned about it. And by the way, he designed it. It's not that he doesn't care about it. Apparently, some of the people in the congregation at Corinth were, as we will find out and have already found out, some were misusing this. Some were feeling that now that I've been forgiven, of all the things I've ever done wrong by virtue of the Lord's sacrifice for me, I'm now free to do whatever I want and satisfy all my needs however I'd like to do it. And so, hey, you know what? There's nothing wrong with going out. I have a sexual desire. I'm going to run out and find a prostitute and get that satisfied because you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I do that. That's the body. And, and, and some people have probably misunderstood this this freedom to think that my, whatever I do wrong really isn't going to matter. Remember, the body's going to die anyway. And so who needs that old tent? I'll just take care of its needs and not worry about a thing. And, uh, and I'm forgiven. But that's not right. They're not thinking about it right. That's not a godly way to think about it at all. God does care about your body. Oh, and by the way, they're concerned about, and we're going to get to this resurrection. What happens to your body? Do you get a brand new body? Uh-uh. Sorry to say. He's going to take the old one and refurbish it. That's a whole nother discussion. But keep that thought in your mind. 
So the Lord is concerned and dedicated to your body. Your body actually means something to him. And he goes on to say, now God has not only raised the Lord. You see, now he's jumping from the food analogy and the sexuality uh, analogy. He's talking about that. Now he's, he's, he's jumping to this point about God raising the Lord. And as far as you're concerned, you know what? He's going to raise you up through his power. There's the, little, there's the little subtlety, and there's many other passages we go to and we will go to. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we talk a lot about this, about the resurrection and what God's going to do. And um, what he's saying here is, remember, God raised the Lord, Yeshua, from the grave. We were well aware of that. And he's going to raise you up too. And when you remember when Yeshua was raised... When they saw him, what did they say? Lord, is that you? Yes, it looks like you. Because in his resurrected body, he still looked like the one they recognized. They're going to raise you up, and you're going to look like you do now, kind of. Kind of maybe a little polish here and there. A little refining here and there. Some of us are hoping for more refining than others, I know. But he, Paul's reminding the people, he's going to raise that body of yours back up. He's talking about the resurrection. Get ready for it, folks. It'll happen before you know it. This is not the end of your life. This is not the end of life for people who know him. In fact, it's not the end of life even for people who don't know him. That's another scary thought. We won't go off on that tangent right now, but uh, God is, uh, has some surprises for us. Do you not know that your bodies are now members of Messiah? You see, Paul is pointing out to them that perhaps the immorality that they're experiencing and, and participating in. You guys realize what you're doing? That the body that you have, because you're a believer, is now a member of Messiah. Maybe you'll look in the mirror a little differently next time and see that the body that you're looking at in that mirror is now a a member of Messiah. And if it is, are you, if you are engaged in prostitution, are you then going to take this member of Messiah and make them members of a prostitute? Is that really what you're going to do? That's unimaginable for Paul. He can't imagine somebody would want to do that. Would you want to do that? There are consequences to these things. And Paul is trying to point that out to them. Shall I then take away the members of Messiah and make them members of a prostitute? He says, may it never be. God forbid. God forbid that I would do that. That's what Paul says to them. God forbid that you should do that. Would I do that, he says? God forbid. Or do you not know that the one who joins to a prostitute is one body with her? Now, here's an explanation that they probably have not understood before. Paul probably didn't really emphasize this when he shared the gospel with them a couple of years before when, when he formed the congregation. Do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is now united with her in some way? It's not like you just went in and relieved yourself and now you're... It's like nothing happened. No, there are implications that you need to be aware of. For he says, and he's quoting now, Paul quoting now from Genesis chapter 2, verse uh, 24, he says, for he says, the two shall become one flesh. And you remember that, uh, that 
the full text of that is right here. I've reproduced it. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Part of it's, the last part says, A man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now we understand a basarachad means a, a, a single joined unit. You have to leave your father and mother to do this. And what God is saying is your commitment is no longer first primarily to your parents as it was. You leave them and now your commitment is to your spouse. And in that part of that commitment is the sexual commitment of becoming one flesh. This is a serious and, a, and, and you might say a permanent, as far as this life is concerned, commitment. When you leave your parents and you join and get married, as God has designed it, you become one flesh as far as God is concerned. Now, if you go and, and have sex with a prostitute, he's saying you have taken that union that was planned for a, a spouse and now all of a sudden you've broken that and, and, and made that union with a, with a prostitute. Because God takes this kind of thing much more seriously than a lot of us tend to. Certainly more so than a lot of the, the Corinthians were taking it. And he says the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Do you realize that you are joined in a spiritual connection with the Lord? And notice how this is, connect, this is almost the same words he just used here. The one who joins himself to a prostitute has become one physically with her. He says, but you're already one spirit with the Lord. You are spiritually joined with the Lord. That's, that's the, the membership that you have. Your, your, your spirit is connected. And uh, the, the scripture teaches that uh, you are uh, body and spirit. And you've received now the Spirit of the Lord, and you have a connection now with Him. So that portion of your being is now connected with Him. Don't do that. Don't join with a prostitute. Flee from it. Flee the immorality. Run from it. A phrase that Paul uses elsewhere, we'll find we get... Chapter 10, he talks about the same thing as regarding idolatry. Run from it. Run from it because if you even spend time thinking about it, you're liable to fall to the temptation. He goes on to say, every other sin that man commits is outside his body, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Really? Is every other sin that man does is outside his body? How about this? How about gluttony? That's maybe not good. That's kind of something to do with your body. How about drunkenness? That's, that's not a good thing for your body. How about uh, chain smoking? Uh, I wouldn't say that's good. How about drug abuse? These are all things we do to our body. How about... Uh, Overwork. Anybody here a workaholic? Used to be before you retired, right? Anybody? Some of us are. I, I see some hands going up because I think, unfortunately, uh, some of us are. And we find out later that that was uh, probably not the, the wisest thing to do. These are all examples, and, and you could probably think of some others, of things we do to our body that are sinful. Gluttony, we overeat, we overdrink, we, we, we abuse ourselves in so many ways. We don't take care of ourselves properly, we don't exercise, we don't make time for that. And so we're not, take, we're not doing the right thing with our body. How is this, how is the sexual thing the only one, every other sin that man commits is outside the body? These seems look like things that are inside the body. How could this be, Paul? What are you thinking of? You see, sex reflects the most intimate of communion between you and any other human that you could ever have. It is unique in that sense. It is not just to be taken lightly. 
from God's standpoint, he clearly says, when you join with your spouse, you become one. You are one flesh. You have done something that was God-ordained, but also meant to be permanent. For the years you have on this, on this earth, sex is, is therefore the most intimate of all the, the communions, the relationships that you have. So it is reserved, therefore, for the most permanent relationship. Don't violate that. That's different than gluttony. It's different than drunkenness. You know, all of these, by the way, are fixable, pretty much. You can turn around. You get on a diet. You can lose the weight if you've overeaten or, you know, you're eating the wrong things. You can change. If you're drinking, you can, with some help, maybe get over that. All these other things, these, these are, you can turn them around. But you can't turn around this. Once this is done, that sin is now a sin that you have committed to your body. Or do you not know? Do you not know? You don't understand that your body, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, something we've, uh, we've met, that Paul has mentioned earlier in his letter, as you recall. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Your body is a temple. Now pause on that one for a moment. I mean, really, really stop and think about what that means. That you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you right now. Now, you know, you look in the mirror before you came to faith and you look in the mirror after and it kind of looks the same. But not to the Lord. And if you realize that the Holy Spirit is with you, He's, he's with you. If, you. if you join yourself to a prostitute, that Holy Spirit is still within you. He doesn't leave you. How disastrous is that? What kind of a union is that? Don't you realize who dwells within you? And also, another thought, you are not your own. You see, you think that the Lord has freed you from sin and now you're free to do everything that you want to do, but the fact is, you are not your own. You were a slave to sin, Paul says before. You're not freed now. You're not a freed man. I am, but you're not. <laughs> See, Friedman, that's what. You're not your own. He goes on to explain that. He says, for you have been bought with a price. Wow. Wow. And not just a little price. God has paid an infinite amount for you. The blood of his own son has been given for you. How precious must you be that God would do that for you? Think about that, how God looks at you. You are so precious to him. We all know how precious life is. When we lose a, uh, a cat or a dog or an animal, some of us are deeply wounded. As we identify and connect with life, God has a much stronger connection with you because you are much more valuable, are you not, than a sparrow. I could, we could talk at length about how God, how wonderfully God has made you and done something to you that he has not done to any other life that he has created. Humans are the only ones that are God-breathed, that God put the breath of life into him when they made him. They're made in the image of God, and they contain this, his breath when they were formed. The price he paid is something that uh, we can't even imagine. 
how big a price that is. Paul should have put a huge in there. I think I should edit that a little, a little a carrot. For you have been bought with a huge price. And therefore, God says, based on all of these things, that all the reasons why you should be careful to do with your body what God is calling you to do and not what you might otherwise be led to do. Because with, for all these reasons, you should now glorify God in your body. Everything you do should uh, glorify the Lord. Paul is calling us to use our body and take care of it as if it was not ours, but his. And you know what? He bought it, folks. He owns it. It's really not yours. You still are a slave. You've moved up now from being a slave to sin. You're now a slave to God. You're not your own. That body is not at your discretion anymore. He has a call on it. Glorify God with your body. Yes, God really does care what I do with my body. And he's talking to each and every one of us today. Think about what you're doing. Are you taking care of yourself? Are you? Because, yeah, some more than others, right? Some of us are doing a little better job of that. If you're not, maybe you should start thinking about being a little more serious about that. Especially if you're interested in ministry. Because uh, taking care of yourself is part of doing ministry. You see, if you're not well, then you're limited on what you can do in a ministry sense, aren't you? People may have to come and take care of you instead of you taking care of others. God has given us many reasons here through the words of Paul to take care of your body. As we close, let's, uh, let's talk to him about it. Take, take a moment to pray. Father, uh, we thank you for your word and for the reminder, Lord, that we are not our own. We are not free to sin, but we are free uh, only to live for you. And it is our desire, therefore, in this moment, that we might truly, uh, might truly want to do those things that are pleasing to you, including taking care of ourselves and using our body as you would have us. Lord, may we, uh, may we actually change even now if we have not already may we decide that from this moment on that we're going to take care of ourselves not just because it'll be good for us but because lord we want to serve you and we know we recognize lord that for all the things that that you care about our body is one of those things and so father help us to uh, to not do uh, immoral things with it uh, even if we are uh, tempted to do that in this world that we live in, that immorality surrounds us. We're constantly drawn and tempted and to do th wrong things. But Lord, uh, may we, in those weak moments, may we remember and turn to you and recognize who we are because of what you have done and that we are owned by you. So Father, uh, give us the strength to live for you a moral and a holy life that is pleasing to you, an example to those around us. And uh, we'll give you all the glory because you're the one who deserves it. And we thank you again for your word here this morning. B'Shem Yeshua Mishikhenu, in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen.